we forget that. And because we forget that, mm-hmm. what, what happens is that we have this false idea that we live in a world where effort equals success. It does not. Hi everybody, this is Carolina Millan. Welcome to a new podcast episode and today I am here with a very special guest, Mr. Vishen Lakiani. He's the founder of Mind Valley. How are you today, Vishen? I'm doing good, Carolina. I uh, thank you for taking the time to be here. It means a lot to me. Huge fan of your work and I'm sure you're going to add so much value to my audience in Latin America. So By I the way, I just it. want to say you are so you are so energetic and you're so bright. I love the yellow dress. I love the Thank enthusiasm you. radiating from your face and your smile. Um, <laughs> it's nice to see someone so alive. Thank you and so I- much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So my first question for you, of course, is in in your life, you know, what, what was that moment when you decided to, you know, to turn what you were doing into Mind Valley? What was the moment that you decided to to create Mind Valley. I was jaded at my job. So one of the things about life is that I have a philosophy of life. And um, I, I believe that we are guided. We are guided into things which need to be on our path. So I believe that part of life is what we choose. But I also believe that every soul, part of life is destiny. And sometimes what puts you on the path towards your destiny is something that just comes and bam, it it slams you or it derails you. But within the context of this derailment, you pick yourself up, you put the pieces together, and you end up discovering what you're really meant to be on. So in Zen philosophy, this is called a Kensho moment. It is growth through pain. So I had my Kensho moment, my grow through pain in and I remember the exact moment it was New York City it was a rainy day I was walking through New York and I was feeling really miserable and sad because the company I worked at was just not inspiring me anymore and worse in the company I worked at the culture was so bad it was just so bad it was rife with racism with sexual harassment Uh, It was just an awful place to work in. Now, remember, this was 2003. The world was a very, very different place. But I couldn't leave the company because my visa was tied to the company. See, I grew up in Malaysia. I was working in the U.S. And, of course, your work visa is attached to the company. If you leave the company, you lose your visa. And so it was a very difficult decision. It wasn't just, do I leave? It was, do I leave this company and leave America? And it was a rainy day in New York. And I love New York. I love the United States. I'd been there for nine years, but I had to make that decision. So I decided to quit. And as soon as I decided to quit, I was one of the top performers in the company. My boss called me up and he he offered to raise my salary. But at that point, I just knew. I just knew deep inside that quitting was the right decision. Something felt right. I quit my company. I quit the country. I moved back to my home country of Malaysia. And I decided to start Mind Valley. And that's really how how I made that crucial decision. So often a pain that you're feeling, it could be that you need to leave someone. It could be that you need to leave a company. It could be that you need to leave a city. Sometimes there's a seed of truth in that pain. And I always encourage people to, to listen and try to really pay attention to that dissatisfaction Mm, and have the courage to, to, to make a shift. That takes a lot of courage because, as you said, you didn't just quit the company, you quit the, the country and yeah, had to start all over back to back home. But like you just said, it, it was, you know, that's how Mind Valley came to be. Oh. So in- Yeah. So, so, so now, now the thing is, you don't want to just quit, right? Typically, you're in a state where there are two forces. One is the Kensho, the dissatisfaction, the pain. You know something is off, but then there's another force. And that other force is best expressed by Steve Jobs in his famous 2005 commencement address at Stanford. He said, listen to your heart and intuition. Somehow they already know who you are to become. In my case, I was listening to that heart and intuition. I was in technology sales. And what it was telling me was that I don't belong there. 
I belong in something involving the field of personal growth, human development, and education. But that pull was so, so, so strong. I had the Kensho, and then I had the heart and intuition. And that's why I was able to make that decision. So you must listen carefully. There are two voices. Both voices speak to you at the same time. One voice is saying, let go. And the other voice is saying, come here. I know I, I, I'm, you know, I follow you a lot, of course. I know that you're doing a masterclass very soon where you're going to talk about this, but I wanted to ask you, um, what did it take to, to go from zero to 100 million with Mind Valley? And what was the role of, you know, meditation, intuition, which we were just talking about in, in that journey? Okay, so if you're looking to build a company, it's like deciding to go on a really long run. Okay, so usually most people after two kilometers, they say, okay, I'm done. That's it. I'm going to head home. Then there are other people who after five kilometers say, that's it. I'm, I'm done. That's my run for the day. And then there are some people who just don't want to quit. They want to run the marathon, right? And it aches and it hurts, but they push past that pain. They push past. When you're running a marathon, there's a certain point. I think it's at the 21 kilometer mark when you hit what is called a wall and your body basically says, you cannot go on, you can't go on, like this is the limit and you push past that. Hmm. And then the rest of it actually becomes easier. Now, that same analogy is true for business. After the first two kilometers, many entrepreneurs are like, okay, I got to my 2 million, I'm done. This, this is all I need to like live the life I want. And then there are some who wanna keep going till five kilometers. There are some who wanna hit 21 kilometers. Let's say a parallel is 20 million and that's still pretty good. And then there's one in 5,000, that's the statistic, one in 5,000 entrepreneurs get to 100 million. And um, I'm not saying that's the right path for everyone, but I wanted to run 100 kilometers. Now, the interesting thing is this, and why I love the, the marathon analogy, it's around the 20 million mark that I found was the most painful. Similar to in a marathon, it's the 21st mile. That's when I hit the wall. That was the part where I was stagnant at for the longest amount of years. It's very hard to scale beyond 20 million. So you got to try lots of different things. You got to be prepared for failure. You got to be prepared for pain. You got to be prepared for stress. That was the freaking hardest part. Once you get beyond that, it actually gets easier. Once you get to 100 million, it's easier than it is at 10 million. And that's where I am right now. Mm -hmm. That is, yeah. I mean, I've heard people say that, but it it does, you know, it does make sense when you put it that way. <laughs> so you just got to know that the realities of it, but know that it's going to get harder before it gets easier. Mm. It never gets completely easy. Yes. But it gets easier. Well, I wanted to ask you something about, about specifically about business. Now, I know that, that, You've been ma you managed to grow the company to 100 million mm -hmm. and you shared you know the next goals you have so how do you keep your members because i've tried having my own memberships before mm -hmm. you know i i do online courses as well different topics of course not meditation or spirituality but more marketing and that kind of thing um so how do you keep your members what what strategies are you guys using to keep people year after year or month after month okay so basically if you're building a subscription business and i don't know if this is the topic of um, um your podcast if it's if it's focused on this specific but it's um um firstly a lot of that is internal to mind value i can't share but i can tell you a subscription mm -hmm. business is is tough yes. it's really tough I think the most important thing is brand. you got to have a really great brand that people love. So we focus a lot on really building a great brand. Mind Valley is one of the few ed tech companies where people actually tattoo our Wings logo on their body. They wear T-shirts with the logo. They buy accessories with the logo because the brand means something to people. Mm -hmm. So that's the real secret. It's about the brand. Mm -hmm. It's making people feel a part of something and not just, yes. right. not just a client or a member. What is the biggest challenge you're facing in your business? For me, it's scaling, actually. I've been okay. stuck. Where, yeah. where are you now? Well, I've been stuck in, in the five-figure per month level for a little while. I've, I've, I've had a six-figure month, one or two in the past, right? But then it went, I went back down for several 
personal and business circumstances. Right. So and how right do you now, make, yeah. How do you make money? How do you make a five? And five figure months are really good, right? Yeah. How do you make your five figure month? I, well, I do a lot of content for sure. Uh -huh. I do webinars, I do master classes, I do five day challenges, online events. And you're selling and you're selling what to make these five figures? I'm selling education, I'm selling courses, mentoring, group coaching, everything around marketing and helping personal brands mostly who want to sell online. Yes. Got it. Okay. So one of the best ways to to get to the next level, right? Is is to understand this. So if you are any type of teacher, if you're any type of teacher, any type of person who is selling your content, your ideas, you're essentially selling yourself. And you got to understand why people buy from you. Now, people buy from human beings that they like. It's called the principle of likability. We buy from human beings that we like. But it's a little bit more nuanced than that because even liking someone can be broken down into different components. So the first thing is people must like you. They must trust you. Mm -hmm. They might trust that you are going to deliver more than what they are paying you. They must trust that you are not manipulative. You are not out there just for money. And there are so many coaches and teachers who are out there just for money. Yes. So they must like you. They must like being in your presence. And what causes like likability? Kindness. A lot of it is energy, how you make people feel. It's it's the way people feel in your presence. Mm. But then trustworthiness is another one. That's like being able to peer into your heart. Trustworthiness, you cannot fake it. Yeah. And if you fake it, you're a con man. Yeah. Because the only people who seek to face trust, fake trustworthiness are con men. So we got to be very careful, right? But trustworthiness, if you can display it ethically, honorably that's really important but even those two are not enough they can like you they can trust you but that's a third thing they must respect you and respect comes from knowing that you have a high degree of competence in your field like you trust you respect you like trust respect these are the three things that you got to cultivate now trust means being very very, 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 very honorable in your business dealings. So for example, one of the ways I create trust within Mind Valley is that all the authors I work with, they have the same terms. If somebody comes to me and said, hey, Vision, you know, I, I want this special edge case. And if I decide that it's fair for them, it goes to everyone. I once had an employee who came to me and said, Vision, in my field right now, salaries have gone up 20%. I want a 20% raise. I'm like, you know, you're right. We did the market research. Your particular field, salary is up 20%. We're giving you a 20% raise. But I also knew there were five other people in his team who did not ask for the raise. All of them got the 20% raise. That's trustworthiness. Now, likability. Likability can be broken down into many things. Likability is how people feel around you. It comes from the way you display energy. It comes from the way you treat people. It comes from the way... It comes from you feeling deeply connected to the people around you. So you're not just in your head and your ego. It also comes from little things, the way you carry yourself, the way you walk, the way you dress. All of these things matter. Nobody wants to be around a sloppy person. Mm. If you are healthy and radiating health, more people want to be around you. If you have, but you can go really deep into likability. I do voice training. I've trained on body language. I've hired a style coach. I have a charisma coach. I have public speaking coaches. I just got back from LA where I did five days studying acting. Why acting? Because when cool. you learn to be an actor, you learn how every little nuance of how you communicate matters. A great actor in front of the camera even knows precisely when to blink. So all of these create likability. But then the final thing is respect. And respect comes from the slow accumulation of skills, experience, and mastery. To get respect, what you got to do is you cannot be obsessed within your business. You got to carve out 20% of your time, mm. no matter how busy you are, to learn and grow. 
So 20% of your time, you're tinkering, you're experimenting, you're taking classes, you're learning, you're growing. It freaking baffles me how many entrepreneurs don't bother to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a business mastery training tomorrow uh, for four hours. I'm just teaching entrepreneurship. And I sent an email to my 2 million list and I said, listen, it's a Thursday. I'm doing it because this is the time I have. I know many of you are working. Skip your work for four hours. Skip your business. The four hours you spend with me, you will make so such massive leaps than four hours trying to tinker with what you already know. But many entrepreneurs don't get that. Yeah. So mastery is really important. And this creates that secret formula, trust, like, respectability. Now I can tell you that um, when you curate this, what happens is you become a more polished brand because if you're a teacher, you are the brand. At sells an iPhone, the feel of the iPhone, the weight of the iPhone, the speed of the iPhone, all matter. But if you're an educator, if you're teaching online, your likability, your trust factor, and your respect factor all matter. That's the secret equation. And so you got to go deep into perfecting every nuance of being a great human. We forget that. And because we forget that, mm -hmm. what, what happens is that we have this false idea that we live in a world where effort equals success. It does not. Now, the trick that you got to do is that you got to create a vision for your life. Your life is going to manifest whatever you believe. If you believe that hard work equals success, that will be true to you. But many billionaires I know don't have that belief. They have a belief that is more like this. Okay, so I'm going to share with you three beliefs of people who have built $100 million businesses and more. The first belief is this. The amount of effort I put in has no correlation with my success. I have one billionaire friend. Uh, this guy literally took seven companies public. He once told me, you want to be a billionaire? And I said, yeah. And he goes, let me give you some advice. Work no more than 21 hours a week. I'm like, what? He's like, work seven hours on Tuesday, seven hours on Wednesday, seven hours on Thursday, Monday and Friday, keep it completely free. And I'm like, but I'll get bored. He goes, no, you won't. Here's what you don't understand. Mondays and Fridays, you keep it free to explore opportunity, to dive into books, to, lead, to, to read. If a friend calls you up and say, hey, come and check out this business opportunity in London, I can hop on a plane in Dubai. Be in London by Friday morning. Check out that business opportunity. Have fun with my friend. Enjoy the nightlife of London on the weekend. Be back by Monday evening for my meetings on Tuesday. Work 21 hours a week, he told me. So you see, 21 hours a week doesn't mean you're only working 21 hours a week. And this comes to rule two. Rule two is acceleration versus navigation. Mm -hmm. So what this means is that there's a time in your business when you push the pedal to the metal and you're accelerating. And there's a time when you are not on your business. You are out there exploring. When me and Naveen Jain take a 10-kilometer hike and talk about building billion-dollar business empires, we're navigating. We're talking about how the world is changing, what opportunities are arising. And when I go back to my business, I can see my business in a whole different way. That's rule number two. Now, rule number three is also really interesting. It is the rule of problems. Great entrepreneurs have a unique attitude to problems. The pro and the attitude is this. I solve all problems that come my way in a fun and easy way. In short, the problems are going to come. The pain associated with the problem does not exist. Mm. You trust in your intuition, your gut, your soul, your expertise, your skills, that any problem that comes to you, you can solve in a fun and easy way. Now, let's stack those three rules together, right? My work has no correlation with my success. Acceleration versus navigation are both equally important. And the third one, I solve all problems that come my way in a fun and easy way. These three rules when you stack them together become your new mantra for running a business don't you ever tell yourself you have a fear of success you're simply yes. bullshitting yourself I you am. are basically playing in your own false interpretation of reality mm -hmm. life gets easier as you get more successful but you got to have these three fundamental beliefs in how you navigate life mm -hmm. What do you think the actual underlying fear is that people disguise as this fake fear of success? What is the, what is the actual fear. fear? You don't have a fear. You just have a misunderstanding. So, 
Okay. It, it, it's a misunderstanding. Just it, a misunderstanding. You take someone from the 17th century and you say, hey, you want to drive a car? They're like, what? You're expecting me to go in a metal container and be hurtling <laughs> down the freeway at 100 kilometers per hour? I'm going to kill myself. Yeah. No, they just don't understand that there's a steering wheel, that they are airbags, that many cars today have advanced collision avoidance systems and seat belts. You just don't understand how the world works. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a fear of success. It's a made up stupid idea. Mm -hmm. that you have taken on. Mm -hmm. And I refuse to address how do I overcome fear of success? That's like saying, how do I, how do I stop fearing aliens abducting me? <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm with you. You I'm are living in a false construct of reality. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree.